Hello everyone, welcome to Special Conversations. Um, I'm Laura Sims, your host, and I'm so excited to be here with Marina Mudos uh, with her latest novel, We Are All We Have. Two beautiful copies here at the library, and these are also, these are Marina's books, her copies. Um, I was totally captivated by the story of a young immigrant teen living in the U.S. whose life is upended when ICE agents come knocking at her door and take her mother away. Um, the novel does a beautiful job of illustrating the struggle that many immigrants face, and it's also just a page turner of a story. <laughs> it's just fun and wonderful to read. Uh, before we get into the novel, though, I will just tell you a bit about Marina. So she is the author of award-winning fiction and nonfiction. Her novels for young people are The Long Ride, Watched, Tell Us We're Home, and Ask Me No Questions. Her nonfiction books are Remix, Conversations with Immigrant Teenagers, and two co-authored books, Eyes of the World, Robert Kappa, Gerda Taro, and the invention of modern photojournalism, and Sugar Changed the World, written with her husband, Mark Aronson. <laughs> Budos has received an NEA fellowship in creative writing and has been a Fulbright scholar to India and was a professor of English at William Patterson University. So please join me in welcoming Marina. And I think you were going to read a bit from the book. Yeah, okay. I think you know. I think I'm going to read just from the opening because, in a way, that um, you know, it doesn't doesn't require any kind of setup or context for all of you. I just wanted to say that the opening of the novel. I'm not going to actually give the full quote. Um, I give two sort of quotes at the very beginning of the book. One of them is from the Southern Poverty Law Center, and it's really speaking to um, the zero tolerance policy that had been instituted by the U.S. at that time, and um, how hundreds of children, of the children, including infants and toddler, toddlers under the age of five, were separated from their families at the border. So this is kind of the atmosphere I'm writing into. And then I have another quote. There, and this is from Peter Pan. <laughs> Their faces assumed the awful craftiness of children listening for sounds from the grown-up world. So my opening. They're coming. It takes a second for the words to drip into the thick soup of my lips sleep. They're here. The words make ripples in my half dreams. A lamp switches on and a bright band of light stings my lids. Rania, they're here. I wrench up from the quilt, my heart quivering. Who? Just come. Ami nods to the other bed, where my little brother Kamal is sleeping. Don't wake him. Of course, I grumble. I punch my pillow and force myself to get up. Kamal's protected. He's sensitive. Don't let him hear. With me, her voice is flat, practical. I follow her out of the bedroom. She's still in her jacket for work, a black windbreaker that makes a rubbing noise as she walks. The keys are still in the open door. She hasn't even pulled out her sofa bed. Several people are crowded outside her apartment. The fizzing, garbled sound of a walkie-talkie from the hall comes from our living room. My heart speeds up. They're in black quilted vests with police on the back. No, not us. A woman turns to me, the one with the walkie-talkie. Hold, she says, and quits off. And this is my daughter. Any other children in the apartment? My son. And your daughter is how old? A hesitation. Eighteen. Ami! I start, but she flashes me a cool, forbidding look. That's a lie, I want to yell. I'm not eighteen for seven months. December. I'm tall, very tall, taking after my dad, so most people think I'm older than I am. I get away with a lot. The teachers who don't say a word when I come to pick up my little brother. The kids who hit on me to buy them beer at the liquor store. Me and Ami both stretch the truth when we have to. The woman looks up at me. We'll have to see some ID then. Ami gives her one of her charming smiles. Can you wait just a moment? She takes my arm and draws me into the foyer. Ami, I whisper. My ID says I'm 17. Why did you? Hush. 
She sets her hands on my shoulders. Ami is so short, she has to lift her chin to meet my gaze, but she can still terrify me with one firm look. No time for panic or baby stuff. I'm not a baby. Her eyes dart in a dozen directions. There's a plan. What plan? I yank up my sweatpants, worrying the string. I tried to call Maria Auntie, but she's not home. She's on a shift. Why did you say I was 18? Rania! She shakes me lightly. You're minors. You can't be left on your own. On our own? My eyes swing around the foyer with her. Wait. Panic starts up in my chest. Ami can't go. She's fumbling inside a table drawer, taking out an envelope. Ami once showed me the paper inside, explaining, if anything happens, this is what you need. It's a standby guardianship form. Maria Auntie will take care of you. Maria Auntie lives down the hall and is our surrogate aunt, since we don't have family in this country. She brings us foiled dishes of arepas and tamales, and we get our extra keys with her. Maria Auntie is a lot like Ami. She's got hustles and side hustles to keep her family going. Everything okay over there, the officer calls over. Ami pulls me back into the doorway. M my mistake. My daughter is 18 in a few months. The woman gives us a skeptical look. So you've appointed a standby guardian? Yes, yes. She thrusts the folded paper at the officer who reads it. And where is Maria Alvarez? My mother's voice fades. Working. The woman squints at the form. And who is this? Lucia Alvarez? Lucia, my mother says bright. Yes, yes. She is home. Maria's daughter. Oh, great, I think. Mean. Lucia, the biggest mess up around. She dropped out of LaGuardia College and got in trouble with some creepy boyfriend. The officer goes down the hall and presses hard on Maria Auntie's buzzer. A few other do doors in the hall crack open, some still with the chain attached, worried faces peering out. I feel a humiliating burn around my ears. We've seen this before, men and women in these same jackets swarming up the stairs, calling through the door, crying and pleading, and then our neighbors were gone. Who is it? Before the officer can speak, Ami calls out, it's us, Sadia and Rania. The door swings open. Lucia's makeup is sneery, one side of her curly hair flat. Yeah. When the officer explains the situation, she rolls her eyes as if to say, you guys are always a pain. I've heard her complain to Maria Ante that they shouldn't get involved with other people's problems. There's a footfall behind me. Turning, I see Kamal in his rumpled pajamas, rubbing his eyes. Ami, he mumbles. My mother looks crushed. Everything she does is to never let Kamal know this could happen. Me, I'm always supposed to go along with her, even if it makes no sense. Take him back in, the walkie-talkie woman says to Ami Burn. May I say goodbye? The woman sighs. This isn't a good idea. My whole body clenches. Every part of me wants to scream, then don't take my mother. Ami kneels down. She's in slacks and a crisp shirt, as if for an office, even though she's been driving all night for Uber. Kamal stretches his thin arms around her neck and nestles in her hair. She's murmuring to him calmly. I'm furious and scared. Then Ami wipes her eyes. Just a minute. Ma'am, don't make this harder. <coughs> she stand. She puts something in my palm, cool and bumpy. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it's her keys to the car, to everything else. She draws me close. I smell sandalwood and a trace of coconut oil in her hair, the stuff that I use for my unruly waves. My mother is so young. It's as if we're sisters, not mother and daughter. You can drive, she whispers. Remember that. True. Ami made sure I took driver's ed, even though I use buses and the subway everywhere. She never lets me drive the car, but she's always ready to flee. We keep a suitcase packed with a set of overnight clothes and toothbrushes in the bottom of our closet. We never buy too much for the apartment, one walk, one towel pan, silverware for four, so we always have to wash our forks and knives after eating. The story of our life for so long. But this time it's not the three of us packed up, sprung, and ready to go, just her. I call out, wait, it's a mistake. Ami pulls back. Her face has gone hard. 
Not now, Rania. I love her. In the morning, call Lydia. She knows what to do. That's our lawyer. My mother and I stare at each other. A staticky voice comes through the walkie-talkie. We need you down here. Another group. A van. Roger that, the woman says. I've got some collateral here, too. Collateral. Ami. The woman gestures to Lucia, who grudgingly comes and stands by our door. You're over 18? Lucia looks to him. Just turned the big 20. Can I see ID? Here, Lucia's bravado falters. She's undocumented. The whole family is. She fishes out an ID. The woman scribbles down the information and gives it back. Okay, you'll need to stay with them. We'll send someone to make sure your mother is ster- ster- serving as standby. The officer gently takes my mother's elbow and guides her past half-open doors of frightened faces. Kamal flings his arms around me and presses his head into my stomach. Lucia nervously picks at her fingers. Behind her toughness, she's scared, just like us. She puts her hands on Kamal's back. Thanks, I whisper. And then we are watching stunned as Ami disappears down the stairwell, swallowed up in a mound of heads and shoulders. It's only after she leaves that it sinks in. This was a raid, an ice raid. I wrench Kamal into our apartment, slam the door, and push down a sob. No, I can't break down in front of my brother. Back in our bedroom, I nudge him into bed. Even though he's trembling and confused, he slides his bare feet under the blanket and turns his back to me. I rush to the window. Down below, several ice agents mill in the hot glare of lights. One puts a palm at Ami's head, steering her toward the back of the van. She glances up at me to our window. I see her mouth move. Run, I'm sure she's saying. Run. What a powerful opening scene. (laughs) So suspenseful and, you know, it moves, but it also establishes all the complexities of the situation. Like, it's not just the family, it's also the neighbors, you know, who are undocumented. You know, it's just really, I found it to be really rich and instantly compelling when I started to read. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even when, you know, it's funny when you're working on something, you're just so working hard to, I'm sure you know this, to kind of get it right. And it's only when I hear myself read it, I'm like, (gasps) (laughs) that's good. (laughs) If you can still get caught up in the movement, that's really, that's a good sign. Yeah. 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 And so how did this book begin for you? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Um, The book began almost as another book. I have previously, I've often written about immigrants. I've often written about the sort of post 9-11 landscape and what it, what that is like for young immigrant teenagers, particularly Muslim teenagers. Although the fact of her being Muslim isn't quite as crucial to this story, mm-hmm. but she is an asylum seeker. Right. Um, and so I've sort of been portraying different beats um, in that story. So I thought I was writing a story. I actually had an idea that I was going to write a story about a family that seeks sanctuary. Um, We belong to a synagogue in in Montclair, and they had decided to become a sanctuary. And I was so inspired by what was going on there. I thought, oh my god, this is such an incredible story. So I wrote an entirely different novel. Um, With Ronnie as the character. I knew my character. I understood, like, she was very clear to me. The parents were very clear. I knew the father was, I wanted to write about immigrants who are educated, who come from, you know, what might even, you might even think a privileged background and yet are in a fragile situation. Because we often don't think of immigrants that way. We don't think of asylum seekers that way. We sort of, the headlines portray them in one, one way. And so I really wanted to get at a more complex story, a political asylum story. Um, so I wrote that whole novel, mm. and I wasn't happy with it. I felt it didn't, I felt it was static. I liked Rania, and so I pulled the whole thing out, wrote this scene, and decided this novel would be actually the opposite of Sanctuary, it would be the ser- search for Sanctuary oh. and a road story. That was smart. That's why it sort of runs. 
It's like that feeling of that you're always running. Yes, someone. and she is through the book. There's you know just movement really pulls you along. So right. Sounds like you suffered a lot, but you got to <laughs> you got to the right place. <laughs> yes, yes. Sometimes you have to put yourself in a cul-de-sac to be able to know where yeah. how to get out. Right. You, so, so you drafted the whole. I drafted an drafted. entire novel. And uh, truth be told, my editors would have published it, but yeah. I, you know, we would have worked at it, but I just knew there was a better novel in me. And so I, I pulled Rania, and I kind of set her in another direction. And, it, it, and really what I was trying to say, what I was after, came out this way. Right. Wow. So, so it was right. That's kind of a yeah. sign yeah. that it was right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And did you um, rely heavily on research while you were writing? A certain amount, yes, I did. Um, insofar as I, I actually hooked up with this woman, Lauren Blodgett, who created an organization called the Brave House in um, in New York City, and it's a wonderful wraparound organization. She's an immigration lawyer. And she really focuses on immigrant girls and young women. And she let me go to immigration court with her. She hooked me into all these other people who could help me understand how could somebody be suspended in the asylum process for so long, which this family is. It's been like eight years. And that can happen. And so she kind of hooked me in and told me stories and gave me a lot of the details. And then I just, you know, dove in. I spoke to people who were part of the sanctuary movement as well. Um, I didn't as much, I spoke to some young people, but more I, I wanted to make sure I kind of understood the landscape that this young person is navigating. Right. And did you do a lot of that before you started writing? Or did you kind of write and then layer in a lot of what you learned? I did most of it before. Four. And then as I would get, as I was thinking through certain junctures in the novel or kind of what if, could this be possible, like just that whole standby guardian thing that you heard about, mm -hmm. right? I had to really suss that out and exactly how it worked. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was something that I, you know, sort of pounded them about to make sure. Because um, I was playing around with different possibilities, and so that they sort of helped me think out loud as I was going. And then I certainly had the I had the manuscript vetted by a lawyer. I've done that before with other novels because since I tend to write novels that sort of are based in the real, and 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 I I draw on that even as they're fictional and imagined. Um, you know, for my novel Watched, that had to do with a surveillance program. So again, I had I had a lawyer vetted, somebody who kind of works with all of that. So, um, but I more or less saturated myself as much as I needed, and then would pull now and then if if I needed a question answered. Right. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I often wonder about that in books that have clearly used research because it's. It's hard to strike that balance, right, between a really good story Absolutely. that pulls you along and one that is grounded in reality. The way I think about it, first of all, I I think of myself as a lazy researcher, <laughs> and I and I and I mean that sincerely because if I over research as yeah. a fiction writer, it can, can sort of deaden. Yes. the imaginative possibilities. Right. And so the important thing for me is to just have enough of a comfort level. But, you know, primarily I'm writing fiction here, so my intuition has to be the guide. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And you feel that in this book. You know, it does not feel laden with research. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, but it feels real, you know. Um, I, I so admire, too, how you are tackling this very heavy subject, but the book has such a light touch to it. And, like, you have this, it's really a fun road trip in the center of the novel, even though, you know, the shadow of, you know, all that's dogging them is there. But was that also intentional, or was that just how the story very much because yeah. in fact that is exactly why I changed the tent why I did a different manuscript yeah. because I what I really wanted to get at is despite this very intense opening and that she's kind of on the run 
it's really, she's also bursting with life. And she goes on the road, road in a way because she's sort of bursting to kind of find herself on the road and find her America. There's all these literary references in the book. She's, her mother um, studied literature. Her father had been a journalist. So words and the legacy of writing and words was very important to this family. And um, so, you know, she, she was inspired by Jack Kerouac's On the Road, and she and her best friend, they called themselves Rara and Fafa, and they did a beat night, and they, um, they, they rewrote it, because they were sort of pissed. It was like, it's Where a bunch of women? white guys, yeah. where are the women? The women are always left behind, they're called girls. You know, it's just a bunch of these white dudes. You know, they get to have all the fun. So they, so she kind of rewrote, you know, did her own version of it. So I really wanted to capture um, that sense where you're, you know, you're 17, you're just bursting, you know, you're so ready to take everything on, even as this awful event happens. Right. So there's even some romance in yes, there. Yes, there is. It's great. And were you inspired by road trip narratives at all, or did you like revisit any that? Well, I did read on the road. Okay, I, I did yeah. read it for the book, um, so I, I wanted. And actually, I really liked it because the thing that was great about it is I do remember feeling like her. Like, wait a minute, you know, it's the guys, and you know, I did yeah. feel it was this guy book. But rereading it this time, I appreciated the language, and and yeah. so I realized how much that energy of the language, yeah, and the sense of possibility. And the sense of ex being experiential and in the moment, right. which is so much what a seventeen-year-old wants, yes. right? And um, and so that I read for this because I, I just yeah. and I read Whitman. Um, okay. It ends with Whitman, well, yeah, and right. so I read some Whitman. Um, you know, um, there are also her mother would always sing Ghazal, so there are Urdu Ghazals that are in there. That form mm -hmm. of poetry. Um, so that I kind of informed me a little bit. Yeah. And w another thing I really admired was that you didn't demonize anyone. Mm. You know, the ice, even the ice agents, like they don't come across great, but right. they come across as humans doing a job. Right. And I don't know, I really thought that you did a great job of, of balancing that, even yeah. though it is a, a harsh critique of, as it should be. Yeah, it's a, it's a harsh critique of a system in of a way, a system. and a moment yeah. in the system where, um, I mean, the very category of asylum, what they were talking about eliminating it, and we were down to, you know, very, very few asylum seekers were getting in at that time. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, that was even up for grabs. Yeah. So, yes, it's a kind of system in a way. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, I actually wound up watching this documentary about ICE, and it, it was amazing that they allowed people access, and they really did. It was a multi-part documentary. And there is that moment when they would do these raids where they would sort of allow people to say goodbye to their children. I mean, they want to move it along. But you know, these are human beings who have who know they have to do this. And right. It's, it's it's some of those some of those scenes are just wrenching to watch. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you yeah. manage to find like the humanity. You know, you have a yes. lot of empathy for your characters. For your yeah. Characters, and there but. are a lot of adults that are trying to do right by them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The people who run the sanctuary, right? Yeah, right. There are people who are trying, um, you know. And the other layer besides the immigration story here, which is, you know, people immigrate and flee for all different kinds of reasons. Sometimes there are personal layers in there. There are political layers. There could be violence. There could be poverty, and their story isn't. A straightforward story. I mean, some of what's going on has to do with her relationship to her family, mm -hmm. and so that too, I kind of wanted to get that in there. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's very in there, and it's yeah, it really does add a richness to, and a mystery because that kind of unfolds. So again, great suspense creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And I love that you you have so many compelling relationships in the novel. You have mother-daughter, which is a big focus. Yes. You have the best friends, right? Fafa yes. and Ra Ra. <laughs> you have sibling relationship with Kamal and Rania and then you have the romance. Yes. Were there was there any and all of them are very well developed and, you know, like I said, compelling and was there one that you were most attached to or well you know I knew that it was good so there was one that I started out with that I knew would be central to the story which is the mother-daughter story because yeah. it is a mother-daughter story in some ways because um, you know her mother's fear says you kind of probably got a sense of from that scene and um, but also not entirely forthcoming with her daughter she had she T keeps it all in, carries it all on her shoulders, and hasn't really been entirely forthcoming and truthful about their asylum application. Mm -hmm. And um, so she is both overprotective and yet burdens Rania. Um, the other thing about her life is it was a kind of interrupted life, you know, which is how she she didn't get to fulfill everything she thought she was going to be, and. She really doesn't know, she hasn't, she kind of doesn't, where, where she ends and where Rania begins, you know, like a lot of mothers and daughters, it's not really clear. Like, there's not mm -hmm. borders and boundaries. She was very young when she Exactly. Right? And so, I think there's a lot that's about, um, I always knew I wanted to explore that aspect. Where, where Rania is going on the road is also about her separating from her mother in some way. So that was like clear to me from the get-go. The discovery, Carlos was a discovery for me. And then it was like, oh, it's I get to write, interest. I get to write a love interest. Yeah, you know, I get great. to write a romance. Um, and a very kind of, um, they're both somewhat old, you know, they, they're both um, young people who've been raised in an old-fashioned way. So it's, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of holding back um, in the romance, but yeah. a lot of feeling there. It's very sweet, yeah. So that was really, that was great, because that was discovery for me. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the best friendship is a really great story, too. Yeah. There's all kinds of different tensions and That's right. layers built into that as well, which I appreciated. You know, it's kind of like a lot of books about teenagers at this age. It's like the summer you grow up on some level. Yeah. And so you've had this best friend through high school, and you're joined at the hip. They, the two of them, you know, they're both from immigrant families, um, and I would say that Fatima has a more, she's, her family's from Egypt, and it's a more traditional, um, they kind of don't want her to go far for college, and they expect her to have, not an arranged marriage, but kind of an approved marriage, so it's some of those more traditional things. Rania's family's situation is not like that at all. But those differences are starting to come in between them, right? Because it's that moment where you get, where you're, you're branching into who you're going to be. And then this kind of exacerbates that, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, you know, as oppressive as Fatima's family is, Rani's a little jealous. I mean, she has a family that's over-oppressive, you know, right. and um, at least she has a family, at least, and she's also documented. And those differences were not a big deal when they were in high school. Right, then. right. So mm -hmm. how do you how do you stay friends with someone when these vast differences start to show up in your lives? Right. I mean, and that's kind of universal to any yeah. friendship, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And especially girls who I think really yeah fuse. very close. Yeah. 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 And there's like we're the same, but we're not the same. Yeah. I really appreciated the amb kind of, I mean, there are things that are resolved and no spoilers, but I appreciated that you let certain things be ambiguous at the end because mm. they kind of have to be. Right. Right. Was that, was it hard to write an ending for this novel? Do you remember? I tend to forget how hard things were because I think I put it out of my mind. Right. But was it hard to so... reach that ending? You know, 
when I write, I tend to sometimes have an image of what, I, I know I have a kind of intuitive image of what I'm writing toward. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a kind of, you know, I'll probably, probably could do it at the end, there's a kind of Whitman reference and the Brooklyn Bridge and, you know, that's important to me. I knew that was in there. Um, I had an image of the, I, I have an image. It doesn't mean I know exactly from a story point of view right. how I'm getting to that. Um, the same exact thing happened in Watched. I, I could see, I could actually almost visualize the scene, but I wasn't sure how I was getting there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I would say though, that like the road trip feeling, once I knew I was writing this book the way I was writing it, it somewhat wrote itself, and then everything was about just amplifying what I'd already written. Okay. And that's when I kind of know a novel, I'm, I'm doing the right, I'm, I'm in the right direction. Right, right. When it has that fluidity, because it's almost as if I'm discovering what's next. Yes, yeah, as you go. As I'm going. Yeah. And then there are areas that are sketchy or need, need amplification, um, and in the editorial process, I'll do that. So I knew I was somewhat writing toward these images I right. had. Right, right. Yeah. Um, oh, but no, I'm just realizing something. <laughs> As you said, that I had two, I just realized I had two images, and I didn't know which one I was going to end on. I don't okay. want to give too much away. <laughs> and one had to do with the border of Canada, and one had to do with the Brooklyn Bridge, and they both get. Yeah, yes. But I don't want to say anything more. No, yeah. <laughs> don't say any more. <laughs> so that's true. I didn't quite know. Okay. But you did have I had these, these images, images that I was making my way cool. toward. Okay. And some of them was trying to figure out what could happen with this immigration situation. Right. Do you think you would have written this book if things hadn't gotten so bad? Oh, what a great <laughs> Question. At the time. That's right. What a great question. Um, I knew in this sort of tri trio of books that I had written, I wanted to write a third. And, you know, unfortunately, you could say that the political situation, you know, kind of right. put it in my lap because I didn't know what that third one was. Yeah. I did know, irrespective of how bad it got in 2018 and 2019 when the family crisis, yeah. you know, when the crisis at the border happened and, 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 and also raids were happening in so many yeah. neighborhoods. Um, and I was sort of doing volunteer work and aware of it. I remember one time going over to Elizabeth um, doing some help with um, refugees there. And my son and I were there and we picked up a little piece of paper off the ground and it was like a know your rights mm -hmm. if they come to your door and it was sort of being given out you know, all over and so I was very aware of all of that yeah. because of, from that involvement I think I still would have written a novel about Rania and asylum mm -hmm. and, and, and something around that context um, because certainly the situation you know, the back story is her father was a journalist in Pakistan and a political journalist who's reported on lots of sensitive um, topics and um, he disappears. We don't know exactly what happened to him. And I'm not giving anything away because that's sort of known from the beginning of the book. Um, and that was real. And um, in Pakistan at that moment, it was like an all-time high for journalist deaths and um, assassinations and bombings and disappearances, but in fact that's wherever there's authoritarian or militaristic regimes, there's this is going on not just in Pakistan. So I knew that I wanted to, I knew I wanted to portray a family where everything kind of like, you know, in a, in a moment um, they have to flee and that it's for that kind of reason, right? So that it got more intensified right. <laughs> under the 2018-2019 period only yeah. lent a kind of urgency, urgency right. to telling the story. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so what is next for you? Are you already on to your next book? 
I am. If I'm one of these people. No, I am so depressed if I'm not writing. Like I'm not. You don't want to be around me. I like the world has no meaning. I walk around just like my husband's here. He knows I'm. I'm impossible to live with if there isn't a project going on. So. <laughs> um, so I actually. Um, I'm. I'm working. It's going to sound crazy, but I'm, I'm working on two projects with another one burbling. Um, so I have a nonfiction uh, book idea that I've kind of worked on the proposal for. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a narrative nonfiction book okay. uh, based on a true story in my husband's family about his um, aunt who lived in open hiding during World War II. Um, under a false identity as an Indonesian nanny. And her husband was in the in resistance in, in Holland. And it's the story of the Dutch resistance and, art, and the role that artists played, which people don't know. So I've been working very, very hard, and I hope that I will be able to do this book. Um, it's called The Foreign Girl. And um, did not fight you for this story. <laughs> a little. He just told me on the way, he says, you know, I think I'm going to come with you to do the research. I'm like, yes, yes, that's great. Um, so that, you know, the, you know, the proposal goes out. Let's hope that I can get to do that. And then I've written an adult novel that I'm revising. Um, so I'm excited about that. That's what I'm going to work on next. Um, and then I'm burbling in my head, like it's it's going to be a ways, but I'm just yeah. sort of note taking um, with a middle grade novel. I want to go down now to that Ooh. kind of sweeter place. That's great. We need. I feel like I'm we good. need more middle grade, great middle grade novels. Oh, okay, good to know. Yeah. yeah. So I it's at that's, that's a very true. very early place, you know. Yeah. It's just little little notes. I also feel like I need to read some. I got to get back into reading for that age and remembering what that feels like. Right. But, um, so I'm like going back to adult and then also and then going to this sweet. kind of sweet, the wow. sweet spot. Um, but you know, the way I work is things are at different stages, right? right? So it's not like I'm trying to start. You right, know. you're not revising two books at once. Exactly, yeah, yeah they're all at different, different stages. phases. That's impressive. Um, does anyone have any questions? For well, I Marina? wondered, Marina, if you would read either the ending or the Oh, yeah, stars I read just letter. one other little tidbit to give you guys. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I am going to decide. Oh, I know. What I, I am going to read the, the story. So this is a, Carlos is the name of her love interest. And he, <clears throat> he is also an asylum seeker, but his, his situation is even more fragile than hers. Um, just um, so he tells her this story, and this is the story. He tells her this story at one point. My aunt used to tell me this story about a fisherman who was in love with a woman in her village. He could never find the right words to tell her how he felt, but every night he would go fishing night of stars. There the words were perfect, crystal sharp. They said what was in his heart. So he gathered his star words in his net and set them in a letter by the girl's window. By morning the crystal words had dried to ugly salt flakes. The girl would see nothing but the dirty paper and toss it away. She understood nothing of his love, nothing what he was saying. He looks at me. Don't you see that's what it's like for me? I was that fisherman who went out to fish in the night sea. I gathered up my words. I was so sure I could move the immigration people, but it didn't work. They can't hear my story. So, yeah, that's part of what I wanted to, what I learned what I learned about the immigration system is it's not always the story that you have to tell, it's the story that the judge wants to hear. And um, 
that's kind of what immigration and asylum seeking and you know when you have to sort of go before. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's part of what I kind of um, learned in doing in the process of, mm -hmm. of doing the book. Right. And you know, as somebody who's a storyteller, right, and she is interested in storytelling with words, I thought that was kind of that was something I really wanted to explore yeah. in a way. Yeah. Mm. Questions? So you think we ought to build the wall? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Marina? Thank goodness have, for Georgia. I have more, but... I like, I like your questions. You what? I like your questions. You like my questions. Yeah. <laughs> I do, when listening to you talk about having all the, the projects going, I am curious to know what your process is, or mm. like your routine. That's a good question. I feel I'm a little unmoored from my routine these days, where I've kind of either worked with great intensity um, and or otherwise languished. Um, whereas, um, you know, as my bio said, I used to teach at William Patterson, and so the structure of teaching forced this very intense discipline on me, where I usually had classes in the afternoons or the evenings, so I would always make sure that, the, that, that those five mornings a week, no matter what, I would do something with my work. And then family life makes it kind of hard on the weekends, right. so I was very adamant about keeping to the schedule during and yeah. I was a professor and you know what they say it's like busy people get more done uh -huh. um, and now I'm I'm kind of finding my way to my structure because okay. now I kind of have a lot more time um, and I'm also as mentioned trying to do several projects yeah so it really depends on where I am mm -hmm. in a project right, right. You know, so um, once something gets going, I'm pretty intense. Yeah. Um, it's just the getting going that is so oh, hard. That's, that's that's the killer part yeah. of it. Yeah. Do you find do you enjoy drafting more or revising or? I enjoy that moment. It, it's the early the moment where it's clicking. Yeah. And there's a fluidity. Right. And I can go forward. Yeah. Right. Um. And I'm, I'm just, you know, the, the momentum of the story is, is taking me in. It's all a discovery process. Okay. I really don't enjoy what comes before, which is trying to get myself to that place. Um, I do like revising. I, I yeah. do like revising. It just sometimes takes me a while to get back inside the world. Yeah. And, um, and then the other thing is, it's exhausting working with editors, because there's always one more thing, I'm sure oh, you've yeah. encountered this, right? Yeah. And you know, by then you are so burnt out and right. you can't, you, you, you just can't see it anymore. Right. Right. Um, and so that's a hard, a hard period yeah. to keep feeling the enthusiasm for that last edit or, hey, this still isn't right, Frank working, and you have to go back and do it. That is um, hard. I enjoy revising by myself. Yes. <laughs> my own revisions and you know I right. feel like I'm hard on myself but as soon as somebody else comes in there's always like a sick feeling <laughs> when you mm -hmm. sit down with those suggestions. Right? That's right. Like, oh I can't I can't do this. And and what gets <laughs> you over the hump of taking in the other? Usually just acknowledging that I have to do it. <laughs> Yeah. So I gotta yeah. figure it out, right? <laughs> or, or if I really feel that it's not right, I will fight back. <laughs> what they're saying, yes, yeah. yes. I will push back. Yeah, which is something I wouldn't have done when I was younger. But yes, now, yeah, yeah. I will say no, <laughs> not doing that. <laughs> uh, what yeah. was? I mean, I'm jealous that anybody can write. I mean. I can't write anything. I mean, I just can't write it. But it, to me, I always find it fascinating that somebody can actually express the feelings in different mm -hmm. situations in a book that uh, 
could never again. I mean, I could never put it together like that. So to me, that is really, it's a gift. It's amazing. Well, you have other gifts as a business <laughs> owner. I'm, I'm not sure. But <laughs> <laughs> other questions? Other questions? You have fun writing? I do. You know, as I said, when I get into the sweet spot, there's the hard moments, and as at the early phases of a book, it just seems impossible. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like this mountain that's never going to end. And there really, I really do feel like when I'm not working on a project, it's it really is night and day for me. I do, I do sort of feel like the world doesn't have meaning, and um, it, it has meaning when I'm making stories. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think that. The need, the human need to make stories is, is profound. Um, it's how we order the world. And so, um, so I do enjoy writing once the world is created and I'm, I'm sort of moving in it. And then I'm, I'm very happy to be splashing in that. that sounds terrific. And do you enjoy the other side of it? Do you enjoy the public facing? Yeah, because you, yeah. you want to feel as if I, I don't want to be, you know, pulled away in an attic all the time. You right. want to feel like you're talking to, to people and, and connecting and finding out. Um, yes, absolutely, and, and prompting conversation. You right. Know. Um, so that's that. Absolutely. Um, Have you visited schools? Not yet with okay. this one because it's so it's new. It's new. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty new. But I have but you been. Have. You know, COVID has sort of changed everything. So I'm hoping things are going to kick back in. Writers are only just getting back going into the schools. Um, I work with a, 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 a sort of an outfit, a speaking outfit, and they, you know, they place writers in the schools. And they said, really, only just now are, are authors going back into the schools. It's been a little funky in yeah. the past two or three years in, in that regard. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I like that. I, I miss, I miss. You know, it's been a few sure. number of years, and I, I miss it a bit. Do you want to mention the, the, the Ari's? Yeah, so one of the things I'm working on is my book launch had actually been a theatrical performance. I've worked with Luna Stage, um, whom I've worked with before, and they dramatized uh, five scenes and sort of adapted. The, you know, it, was, it was melded in a certain way. I, I call it reader's theater. And um, it was a wonderful night. and. You know, the actors got to talk about what it was like to inhabit these characters and so forth, mm -hmm. and the story itself. Um, so we're creating a program that we are going to offer to the schools, where you know we'll go in because it's a nice, it's a nice gateway for kids. They'll see this dramatization and kind of pull them into the world of the book. So I, I love idea. these kinds of things, doing these kinds of things. That's it's, very it cool. kind of gives another life to. Are you more interested in going into schools that are very removed from an ice raid or ones that question. are like that is kind of Both. the life they're living? Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you asked that. That is such a great question. Um, yeah, it's really both. Um, because in a way, what I try to write are books that are opening the eyes of students who would have no idea about this. And a lot of my books are very urban in their setting. Um, and would really not, you know, this would never occur to them. And so I really enjoy that. I used to do, um, I used to work with a friend in upstate New York, and she used to send me to all these upstate New York schools, um, some of which were suburban, but more, you know, some were a little bit more um, rural. And I loved doing that because it was just, it was bringing me into another space because I thought my work was, you know. But I also really liked being urban settings, you know, New Jersey, New York, you know, Los Angeles, those kinds of places where this is a real reality. Um, just the other night, I was at a fundraiser for the Brave House, and five of these young women spoke, and I think three of them mentioned 2019 and the raids. I mean, like, exactly what I'm writing about here. So, you know, it's like, I also, I really, really hope I'm Kind of bringing something where people are sort of seeing themselves represented. Yeah. So it's like a, I hope it's a dual, a dual purpose. But it's a great question. Yeah. 
And what was your path to becoming a writer? Were you always writing when you were? Um, I was one of those kids scribblers. Yeah. Like. I do, but you know, I think I was like a kid scribbler, but I wanted to be an actress. Like you know, you know, like you're you're kind of dreaming of a lot of things. Yeah. But I do I did go away to. Um, I remember when I went away to summer camp, and I wrote my first instead of like nap time. We had would have like this nap time, and I wrote my first novel there. <laughs> I was working on it, actually. I should say I had started it. It was a complete lift of a movie that I loved. It was this movie with Mark Lester called Run Wild, Run Free. And it's about a boy who's, I think his parents had died, and then it takes place in the moors of England. And there's a horse. One night there's this traumatic event where there's a horse in the mud that gets stuck in this like terrible whirlpool of mud and has to be shot or you know it has to be put down and the Mark Lester character doesn't speak he, he goes mute and it's sort of the story of him being able to speak again so I wrote my so I lifted the whole idea of a boy going mute it's a good storyline <laughs> wrote wow. my own version <laughs> How old were you? Nine. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So I was always writing. Always. Yeah. So like I was very much a kid scribbler. But you know the road to being serious about writing. I'm sure you know this, and you know how you are going to exist in the world and make a living and um, you know that was a little more zigzaggy and right. it took a while. Right. Um, but sort of the lore of language and words and sort of making pictures with words in a sense um, was something sort of pretty deep in me. Yeah. Um, and so I think I kept coming back to it even as I try, you know, it's zag away from it. Yeah. Do you always incorporate poetry into your fiction, or is just this protagonist that was interested in poetry? This is the yeah. Poet. Oh, <laughs> oh <my laughs> <God>. question. <laughs> I'm going to read a tiny bit from Whitman. Oh, the, just this one. What I will say is, I don't no normally incorporate poetry. Um, uh, this was one where I made an explicit choice to do that um, because I wanted her. She wants to be a poet, you know, and, um, and words are so important to her. But I will say that even though I write about these kind of hard-edged topics, I'm really interested in the lyrical. Um, I'm really interested in sort of, a, I'm not a poet. I could never be a poet. I'm really a prose writer. But I'm interested in prose that has a lyrical quality. Right? Well, you can tell by what you read. Yeah, it's and like so, the and the, so yeah. yeah, so the sense, the sense of poetry is sort of swirling in me some way, even as I'm very much a prose writer. Um, but this was a case where I really thought, oh, I want the language of poetry and ghazals and so forth to be kind of part of the language that the mother and daughter share, right? That literature and poetry is what they share as part of their language. And um, can, I, can I read that little Please. bit? Yeah, yeah, just because I, I made mention of it. It's a nice way, um, since you asked about poetry. Um, so. Just a scene, mother and daughter. We stand. We're on the pavement that curves towards the entrance to the Brooklyn Bridge. A few bicyclists swerve down the bridge ramp. It seems that everyone has left the city. All the people with cars and houses, with money, have left or are shut into their air conditioned apartments. Makes me think of Whitman on the earners, crossing Brooklyn Ferry. Smiling, I quote. Others will enter the gates of the ferry and cross from shore to shore. On the answers, others will watch the run of the flood tide. We both laugh. Our hands find each other's. I still believe that, Rania. There is room for us in this country. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um,